Welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mariash. Thanks for spending some time with us today. One brief reminder, check out our video interview series, Conversations with B'nai B'rith, on Facebook and YouTube. You'll find discussions with historians, diplomats, Middle East experts, even an astronaut and an NFL player and a, a legendary DJ. Watch our latest content by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook at B'nai B'rith International. Well, before the coronavirus restricted travel and in-person gatherings, Ayala Tours offered Israel and Jewish heritage tours in destinations around the world, led by scholars and expert guides. It's had to put these in-person tours on hold during the pandemic, but found a way to stay connected to travelers by offering virtual programs. Just like the company's in-person tours, these programs bring in scholars and expert guides in Israel, Spain, Central Europe, and Argentina. Joining me today is Professor Stephen Burke, Ayala Tours Scholar in Residence. Pre-pandemic, Professor Burke lectured during trips to Russia, Spain, the Caribbean, Eastern Europe, Europe, and Israel, and has continued to host lectures through Ayala Tours virtual program. Through his Towering Figures virtual program series, Professor Burke gives talks on people who have changed the course of modern history and whose influence remains to this day. In April, to mark Yom HaShoah, Yom HaZikaron, and Yom HaAtzma'ut, Professor Burke hosted a four-part series on Israel, Zionism, and the Jewish people. Since the virtual programs launched in November 2020, Professor Burke has hosted 24 installments with the next installments beginning May 4th and running until May 25th. Past towering figures include Martin Luther King Jr., Theodore Herzl, Margaret Thatcher, and more. In the upcoming program, participants will learn about Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, Mikhail Gorbachev, Ronald Reagan, and Nelson Mandela. Dr. Burke is a professor of history at Union College in Schenectady, New York, and the chair of the Department of History, director of the Program in Comparative Communist Studies, and faculty advisor to the Jewish Student Organization. He's the author of the book, Year of Crisis, Year of Hope, Russian Jewelry and the Pogroms of 1881-1882. And he's published numerous articles on Russian history, Russian Jewish history, anti-Semitism, and American policy in the Middle East. Professor Burke, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. We're excited to have you with us. Thank you. Well, to start us off, can you talk about how did the idea for these virtual programs come about and what the process is of of having made them a reality? The idea came from the owner of Ayelet, a woman that I've worked with for over 25 years. That's Diane Rubchinsky. She and her son, Jeffrey Rubchinsky, uh, came up with the idea of doing something uh, again to do something during the pandemic. It was their idea to do these programs. And then they came to me and they said, well, what what should we do? And I gave them, again, as a beginning, we should talk about towering figures, people who shaped history for good and for bad. And it's worked out very, very well, I must say. So we've had, you know, I think well over a thousand people listening. And uh, I've learned a number of things myself. Well, pre-pandemic, uh, you led many in-person tours. What are, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of presenting information through virtual programs? You know, so many of us, of course, you know, each day go through Zoom meetings. There are people who say, you know, Zoom really brings you closer to the, the in, in your case, uh, to the lecturer. Uh, and there are others who say, you know, it's really to be better at, to go out in the field and have uh, the real-time experience. So what do you say? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Yeah, look, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's a mixed bag here with many people saying it's good and it's not bad and so on. Some people say say it's the pits. Let me tell you, in terms of going out on these trips, uh, there's nothing like being in the place. If you have any, even the most cursory knowledge of history, sense of history, to stand where the Warsaw Ghetto was, for example, to stand on top of the mound where Miwa 18, the center of the Jewish resistance, is nothing like it. Or, for example, to go when we go to Russia and we stay in Revolutionary Square, 
you know, where, on bloody, where Bloody Sunday took place. There's nothing like it. And of course, going to Auschwitz uh, and other places as well. I, I tell people, for example, every Jew, once in his or her life, should go to Jerusalem. Every American, Jew or Gentile, should go, as we have gone on a number of occasions, to Omaha Beach. When you go to Omaha Beach and you go to Point de Hoc, where the Rangers stormed on June 6th of 1944, and not a 90 degree angle on the withering German fire. And then you look up at that magnificent, beautiful cemetery, see those waves of crosses and Jewish stars. I say to the people, every time I go there, blessed is the nation that has people like this. And every human being, again, there's nothing like it. Every human being, Jew or Gentile, American or non-American, should go through Auschwitz to see what human depravity is and then also to learn about the decency and the courage that was exemplified, that was manifested by some people. So there's no question that it's good to be there, right in the place. On the case, in the case of Zoom, yeah, there are some advantages here. Uh, the rabbis say you always learn from your students, right? I learned from my students at Union College. I learned from the people, because I'm talking to hundreds of people, they ask me questions and I learned from their questions. So in a sense, it's good for me. I think it's good for them. And I must tell you, when I deal with my students at, at Union College, there's an intimacy that you don't even get in the classroom. I see their faces on a number of occasions. I see when they tune out. I see what they're eating. So there is an intimacy there that I, that I don't, that I, I would not get in the classroom. The point in all of this is we're doing the best we can. Now, there's one tremendous advantage to Zoom, because that's it really it is in some ways the future of education. When I teach again for IELT, I reach hundreds of people, maybe ultimately several thousand. When I teach at Union, I, again, I, my classes are quite large, and so I teach hundreds of kids each year. So I, I'm teaching at Union 54 years. I've taught over 12,000 students. But Zoom and other streaming, uh, streaming services offer the opportunity to speak to thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even conceivably millions of people. That's the advantage of Zoom. And that I think is the future of education. Well, in terms of what, what Zoom and these lectures, not talking about the towering figures, we'll talk about that in a moment, but the, the places, for example, that you said are a must to see in person. I would think that the whole idea here is since you you can learn just you can learn so much about a place without actually going. So what we have here by what you're doing is kind of the the, the preparation, the background, the context in the hope that um, what will follow ultimately uh, this year, next year, down the road will be that in-person experience to take advantage of what they may have heard in in your lecture. Correct. That is correct. We hope people will eventually go. I'm trying to give them the context, trying to give them the history, so that when they get to these places, uh, they will know. They will, they will have a sense of history, a sense of what had taken place there. I try to do, I, I, I don't want to put anybody down here, but sometimes even the best of guides who know their city very, very well and know some of the history really don't know a good deal of the history of their own country and are unable to put it in a, a, an international context. That's what the historian tries to do. And that's what I try to do on the lectures. But I must tell you, uh, I, I've been doing, I must have run a, or let's say been a scholar in residence for a hundred trips through IELIT. We have always had absolutely superb tour guides. So this is not, this is not a hit at them. They are absolutely superb. I add the historical context for them. Well, so far on your uh, towering figures programs, uh, you've covered everyone from uh, Mao Zedong to Pope Pius XII. How do you, as a historian, because you know, there's the, the range of history, it's thousands of years, how do you choose which subjects to feature in each installment? What are the, the criteria to, to uh, get into the towering figures series? I tell the people that I yell it, as I tell my students, personality counts in history. Powering figures shape the course of history for better or for worse. So I'll give you an example. 
You can talk all you want about inexorable social, economic, demographic. All of these forces are important in changing history. Can anyone deny, looking back at the past century, the 20th century, can anyone deny that the century has not been shaped for better and for worse by six men? Mao Zedong, for example, Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, Churchill, Roosevelt. Again, you can talk all you want about the, the, the flow of history and these are the, what I said to you before, the inexorable forces. Personality counts. These men change the course of history. So I try, in answering to your question, answering your question, I try to find people who, again, for better or for worse, have changed history. So, you know, I talk about Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. We will talk about Nelson Mandela, for example, talk about Golda Meir. We've talked about a, a, a plethora of, of people. Again, some good, some bad. But I think they have all left an indelible imprint on history and upon our psyches. Well, let me uh, ask you the, the, the perpetual question as a historian. Now, you're focusing on great men and women who changed the course of history. Uh, there is the age-old debate. Uh, is it are, are the great men and women who changed the course, or is it the flow of history that carried the great men and women who rose to an occasion, or in the case of, of the dictators, who, um, who brought so much uh, uh, barbarity and hardship onto the world? Where, where is that? Is there a, 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 some kind of common denominator, or are you in the camp which says that the individuals really move history. I'm in that camp, Dan. I'm in that camp that say individuals move history. Uh, and I also believe in the importance of accident and chance. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Let me begin with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt is elected in 1932. Before he is elected, he is in a motorcade in Miami Beach. An assassin steps out, fires at Roosevelt, misses Roosevelt, and kills Mayor Cermak of Chicago, who was in the same parade. How much of history would have been different had Roosevelt not been there in the 1930s and the 40s? I know, again, as someone who is, I want to Jewish, I'm interested in Jewish things, I know the flaws in Roosevelt. I know when it came to the issue of Jewish immigration, the, the man was, I wouldn't say out to lunch, but the man had, had a, a dark side to him here. There's an old statement, in the warmest of hearts, there's a cold spot for the Jews. I think to a certain extent that was true of Roosevelt. Nonetheless, nonetheless, he was a great leader of our country during the Depression, and a great war leader, a man who alleviated the worst, didn't end the Depression, but alleviated the worst distress that came forth in the Depression, assured the American people that good things were going to happen, that confidence and that willingness to really try new things. So what I'm saying to you here is, is Roosevelt. Had he left, do you think we would have had the New Deal? I don't believe so. I really don't. And another example, of course, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, I believe he was the greatest American of the 20th century. I really do. Because the great, I'll use the old language, the great Michigas of our country is this obsession with race. This is the man that began the process of dismantling segregation in our country. It would have happened. There's no question. It would have happened. Things don't stay forever. I, tell, I draw them into my students and I tell the people in the, the my lecture and I yell it. History is fluid. It's not stagnant. It's always changing. But would it have happened as soon as it did if Martin Luther King Jr. was not there? And the answer, I think, is no. So I think, again, and going back, look, I can go Winston Churchill. Churchill has many flaws. We can talk about that. Churchill has many flaws. But for 18 months, England fought alone. And England fought alone because Winston Churchill steal the backbone of the British people. France collapsed. France didn't have to sign an armistice. The fighting could have gone on. But the demoralization in the part of French people and the fact that they, they faced the, the defeat or what they thought was a defeat as a fait accompli, Churchill wouldn't allow that to happen. Now, he was a good little war leader. There were many things that he did that was wrong. But again, for those 18 months, Western civilization hung in the balance, and he was there. Well, you mentioned uh, FDR uh, and uh, Martin Luther King uh, and, and Churchill. So I'll ask just to continue in that 
vein, you're choosing the subject. So who are some of your personal favorite leaders, your personal favorite towering figures, in addition to those three? Uh, and maybe uh, towering figures you haven't yet covered in the series. Who have you got waiting in line? So many. They're all my favorites, Dan. They're all my favorites. I'm a student of history, so I, I believe, as I told you, in the role of personality, FDR is important. Although that blind spot is just something that that failure to do what he could have done. Again, I come back to that. Forgive me for dwelling on that at great length. There's no way in the world that FDR could have saved six million Jews. But he could have saved probably several hundred thousand. But again, for the Depression, for the war, a great war leader. I talked to you about Churchill. I talked to you about Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin is, I, I think, one of my, I wouldn't say heroes, but one, one of the most impressive people that I've ever come across. A modest man, no hint of scandal, sexual scandal. A man that really, the Mr. Outsider becomes the insider. And again, say what you will about Begin. He negotiated the Camp David Accords. And he put it in a way, very good. I think he had a good way with words in a number of languages. So, for example, I don't know if you remember this. Uh, I don't know how old you are, but I see you're a mature person. You may remember this. He came to the United States. And what did he tell the American Jewish community? This wasn't peace between Israel and Egypt. This was peace between Israel and Mitzrayim. And for anybody who had the most, modicum, the most modest sense of history, and when he spoke to the Israelis in that tone, that really meant something. So Begin is a hero. I, I thought a great, I think a great deal of, of Menachem Begin, as I do of David Ben-Gurion. I certainly remember uh, the Begin visits, actually. And I remember something which moved me tremendously uh, when he was on the White House lawn signing the Camp David Accords. He, program was going on and they were signing and uh, and he said at a certain point and now I want to turn to my people and speak to them in Hebrew uh, he to speak to the Israeli people and it was very moving um, that that special um, historical note that we took note of um, that you know after this continuum of Jewish history uh, that the Hebrew language is alive and well and that he is using it, that, that really made a tremendous uh, impact on me. I want to ask you a question. Let me, uh, I just say, let me tell you, another one of the people who really is a hero, although the Russian people don't give him much, much credit today, is Mikhail Gorbachev. Again, the Soviet Union would have imploded anyway. The system was rotten to the core. Even if you didn't know much about Russian history or Soviet history, you come to Russia in the 70s or 80s, and you see 500 people lining up for, for toothpaste, for tissues, for toilet paper. You know the system isn't working. But with all of that, it's Gorbachev that changed. Without Gorbachev, the Soviet Union may have lasted well into the, well into the 21st century. And I must tell you, parenthetically, and this is not false modesty, we were all wrong. Every specialist in Soviet history was a dead wrong. There's even a guy in Canada who wrote a book about Gorbachev and said, he's going to change the system, but Marxism and Leninism will prevail, the Communist Party will still be in power, and so on. He was dead wrong. He got himself a promotion to Harvard, but he was dead wrong. So the point I'm trying to say to you here is, again, a good example. Gorbachev changed the course of history, again, in, in changing the Soviet Union, and through this idea, what in Russian is called Novi Mishleni, a new thinking in foreign policy. Gorbachev helped liberate millions upon millions, tens of millions of people in Eastern Europe. He put a nail, more than a nail, more than one nail, in the coffin in the coffin of communism. So again, another one of my heroes, another man that changed history. Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, as a historian, constantly there are, are new insights, uh, archives that are opened. Um, history is not just history of what happened years ago. It, in a way, history is living because there are always new angles, new new ways of, of looking at it, new documents and so forth. So when you are, are doing your research for this, uh, are you finding out um, even now, after all these years of teaching and presenting these programs, do you, do, are you learning something new uh, when you're preparing these lectures? For the most part, Dan, the answer is no. But on occasion, I do. 
And it forces me to look at things uh, in a different way. Let me give you an example. In the early 1930s, Winston Churchill spoke out uh, almost alone against the Nazis. It's a threat. It's a threat to Germany, and the Nazism will be a threat to the rest of Europe, and eventually a threat to the, uh, to the, to the Great Britain. But no one listened. So as I did the research for this, I understood a little bit more why people didn't listen to Winston Churchill in the 1930s. It's not only because of the impact of World War I, not only because people didn't want to get into a war, not only because of pacifism and isolationism, it was something else. Winston Churchill was a racist. Great as he was, he was a racist. He particularly despised the Indians and particularly despised Mahatma Gandhi. Now, at that time, there were people in England that were beginning to talk about the necessity of disengaging. He was looked upon as a lunatic, a racial bigot, and that's why people didn't listen to him. To be sure, again, I don't know how much history the, the, the people are aware of this, I, his reputation had been disparaged, that is, tarnished, because of Gallipoli. Everybody knows that. He spoke about, he, he was a, an advocate of an invasion of, of Gallipoli in, in the Ottoman Empire and so on. It ended up in a catastrophe, one of the great catastrophes that the British experienced in World War I. So that was a problem for him. But people are not listening to Churchill in the 30s, not, because of, not only because of Gallipoli, but because he looked as if he was swinging from the trees on the issue of Indian, of Indian nationalism. That's one thing that, I, that I've, again, something that I've learned. Also, you're absolutely right. New documentation. Again, one of the great controversies in Israeli history is, of course, Golda Meir's behavior in 1973. Why did she hold back? Why didn't she launch a preemptive strike? Well, we know a little bit more now. We know about the influence of the, the Israeli military, about Israeli intelligence. And we also have a good idea that Kissinger may have told her, you know what? You don't launch that first strike. If you do, don't count on any American assistance. So there's a new way of looking at things. There's always a new way of looking at things. And remember, a historian, no matter how objective he or she may be, sees history through the prism of the present. And the present tells you that we're influenced by things that are taking place, again, at, our, at the present time. So the answer is yes. In doing some of this, for the most part, it's just reinforcing what I already know. But the deeper you go, and sometimes you find new studies, again, I learn something new. Well, since you started this uh, virtual program series uh, last year, you've had, as you mentioned, uh, over a thousand individual participants attend some or all of the programs. What do you hope that your viewers will get out of this series? In the words of a French historian, and I use these words, in the first day of every class that I teach at Union, and I've told it, I've said it again and again in the lecture series for Ayelet, you cannot explain the present by the present. You cannot explain the present by the present. Everything has a history. If you want to understand where we are and where we may be going, you have to know history. That's what I want people to understand. A second thing that I want them to understand is, again, trite but true, we're all flawed. Every one of us is flawed. We know that as individuals, we see it in the great men, the really great good men and good women. We're all flawed. And to use the old language, you got to have, when you judge these people, you have to have a sense of Rahmanus. You have to have a sense of sympathy and pity. So these are some of the things uh, that, that I have learned here. Uh, and and I, I try to really inculcate that into anybody who is listening to me in the study of history. Well, many organizations um, have moved to online programming uh, to stay engaged with audiences during the pandemic. We see it. There are so many webinars, so many programs. It's uh, really a cornucopia uh, to choose from. Uh, and there isn't data goes by that there, there aren't um, new programs that go up. Um, do you plan to continue these virtual programs even after uh, we're all able to return to in-person lectures and tours around the globe? What do you think? Are you going to hold on to this idea, uh, or uh, are you going to go back into in-person uh, lectures and tours? Well, I will certainly go back to in-person lectures and tours. As to the question of whether we will continue this, I'm willing to do it. But it, remember, everything depends on the demand side here. 
are people willing to after after they come out? Are they going to be? Are they all zoomed out? Let me put it that way, as you mentioned before. Are they all zoomed out? Are they going to will be willing to come back to Zoom? Go willing to go back to uh, the online stuff? I don't know. I'm willing to do it. My job, my function, my mission in life is to impel to really to teach people history, to understand what took place. And as I guess I said before, in order to understand the present. I'm not saying you can predict the future by studying history. I would never say that. That's the ultimate of chutzpah. But I, you may have an idea of where we're going. So these are the things I, I, I want to do, and I will do it in any forum that makes it possible. If it's online, if people are willing to listen to me online, I'd be delighted to do it. God willing, I, again, when things are, when the pandemic is over, we'll do our traveling here as, as much as I can. And we've gone to other places besides Europe. We go to Latin America. I've, I've taken, I must tell you, I never wanted to go to China, Dan. Never wanted to go. I used to say there are 1 billion, 500 million people in China. May they live long, healthy, prosperous lives without me. That's what I used to say. And then three times I ended up going to China. I don't regret a single moment of it. Uh, I learned, again, a great deal about China. And since we are talking about a country that is a country that unfortunately may be our rival in the years and decades to come. I thought I think it's a good thing that I went, and I would urge people when it is more when it is appropriate to go to go to go there. Now, if you want to to get into some other things, let me say to you, one of the things we have to struggle with is, again, most nearly all the people who come, not all, but nearly all the people who come on these trips are Jewish people. And for people over a certain age, Going to Poland, for example, is an issue. I mean, we bear the legacy here. We've heard it from our parents and our grandparents of Polish anti-Semitism. Polish anti-Semitism is not an oxymoron. It was there, it is there, and although I don't speak about the inevitability of history, the fact of the matter is it will be there. But there's another side to Poland. There really is. There was always a philo-Semitic tendency within Poland. And again, they were prominent Polish uh, uh, people, literary people. The greatest of all Polish poets, Adam Mitzkevich, was a friend of ours, was a friend of the Jewish people. People ought to know that. And also, again, as Salo Baron used to say, in effect, these are not his words, it's not all suffering. It's not all persecution. It's not all martyrdom. There were times, there were times in Polish history when the Jewish position was very, very good. You don't have great rabbis, great scholars, great yeshivot. You don't have them if people are worried about being killed in the next moment. So in all of these places where anti-Semitism was there, I try to tell people in the trips, I try to tell them, there's a pre-Holocaust history here. And it's very, very important. Eastern Europe is probably the, Eastern Europe and Russia are probably the favorite places that I go to. It's the heartland of the Jewish people. That's where our people, that, that's where people made such great contributions there. And then I can talk, of course, I talk a lot about the Holocaust. Would you believe that I have been to Auschwitz a hundred times? And one of the things, one of the way you can connect the prehistory with the history of the Holocaust is everybody talks about six million dead Jews. And of course, that may even be a minimal figure. There may be more, but it's not only to look at that. You shouldn't look at that only in quantitative terms. Look at qu in qualitative terms. How many future Nobel Prize winners were murdered by the Nazis? How many great men and women who would have made those contributions and that someone after me would be talking about in a Towering Figures lecture series? How much did, not only did we lose quantitatively, how much did the world lose? That's what I try to tell the people on the trips. Well, you know, I think with regard to, to Poland, um, Eastern Europe, you know, there's the term, as you know, facing history. And I have always said, you know, I, now in the interest of full disclosure, I was a history major. I'm not a historian. And as you know very well, there's a big difference between the two. Well. But, but the issue of facing history is extremely important because, in, in my view, that for a country to really be a, a, a real democracy, and democracy is always a work in progress. But to be a real democracy, you have to be able to look in the mirror and acknowledge the flaws and acknowledge the mistakes and acknowledge, in, in the case of Eastern Europe, the barbarity, as well as all of the other positive things 
uh, that, that may have occurred during history, whether it be in culture or in the arts or in science or technology, or whatever. So there's a, it's not, I don't see it as a, as a balance so much. I think it's, it's important for the folks in these countries to really come to grips with the past. Uh, and we see that in many cases, but I have to tell you, uh, because we also work in those areas that, you know, sometimes it, it, is, a, it is a struggle. One of, the re- one of the examples for is right now is our push for Holocaust era assets restitution that yeah. so many, as you know, I mean, you've, you've traveled through these areas so many times, the number of, of synagogues and, and mikvaot and community buildings, not to mention cemeteries, of course, um, that uh, uh, the property, factories, homes, offices that were, that were confiscated. So that's, a, if that's an issue that we face when we, when we are traveling and when we meet with people from, from those areas. In any case, um, I think that what you're, what you're doing is, is fascinating. I'll be very interested to see uh, what happens uh, once we get back to normal, whether you keep the series up or whether you take the Towering Figures program right there, real time on the ground. So when you're in Moscow, you're talking about the towering figures in Russia. And when you're in Eastern Europe, uh, you're talking about the towering figures there or in Argentina or wherever. In any case, we thank you very much, really, for being with us today, Professor Burke. Thank you for all you do. And uh, I hope that uh, you'll have a chance to come back and we can talk about some of the other areas that you have carved out for yourself, particularly Russian history, anti-Semitism in Russia, uh, to talk further. Thank you very much, Dan. And I, it's a privilege to really speak with you. I, as a historian, I know how important and how worthwhile and how good B'nai B'rith has been. So I, it is a privilege for me to, to be talking to you. I wish you and the organization the best of luck and the best of times. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. You. Well, if you'd like to check out Professor Burke's Towering Figures programs, you can learn more and register at Ayala Tours website. Uh, Professor Burke, again, thank you for being with us today and for speaking with us about your fascinating virtual program, staying connected with audiences as you do during the current situation. Well, if you're looking for more of our diverse content, visit our website, benebrith.org, to listen to all of our conversations, podcasts, and live interviews. Tremendous thanks today to Professor Stephen Burke for joining me, and thank you for listening in. And if you like what you hear, make sure you never miss an episode by tapping the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Dan Mary Ashen. Talk to you again soon. Take care, everyone. Bye.